So at first, I was hoping to get to say happy early Thanksgiving for this video. And then I was just hoping to say happy Thanksgiving. But that one didn't work out either. So now, uh, I guess I'll say like merry early Christmas, happy holidays. Yeah, this one uh, took a lot longer to prepare the content and filming for than any of us would have liked. But hey, it's here now. And that's what matters. This is Limit Theory Development Update number 21 covering October and November. Thank you for joining. Um, it's been another really good, productive two months, and as always, very excited to show you guys some of the stuff I've been working on. But before we do that, I wanna just kind of chill for a minute or two. Just take a minute or two, look at some scenery, listen to some music, because I feel like we're always getting caught up in you know, one place in time in these update videos. So for a change, I'd just like to show a few scenes from LT, watch what's going on in them, and uh, I don't know, just sit back and enjoy for a little bit. So we'll get started shortly, but um, right now, just relax. Alright, well, I hope you guys enjoyed that little scenery trip. Uh, I always love just chilling in the game, um, finding a nice system and watching AIs do their thing. It's really good fun. Uh, speaking of AIs, I want to make it known that there are a lot of NPCs in this system that I'm about to show you. Um, well in excess of 128. Uh, eight factions, actually doing their own thing within this one system and uh, the reason I'm telling you this is because uh, quite honestly the engine is starting to feel the stress and so if you notice a little frame latency here and there um, maybe some some stutters occasionally uh, just please bear with me uh, I haven't done a very rigorous optimization pass yet which I will definitely do before release um, but until then, we're just going to have to deal with this because there's a whole lot going on in system. Uh, but it will be taken care of in the future. So, thank you for your understanding. And with that, it is now time to get into the heart and soul of the October and November agenda, which consists of warp nodes and warp rails. Now, these things are, uh, are fun. <laughs> I enjoy them a lot. And this orb orb like energy thing that you're seeing right now is indeed a warp node now it's going to take me an awfully long time to explain all of the conceptual workings behind this mechanic but i can explain the gist of it very simply and easily um these are balls of energy that launch you through space at high speeds yes yeah, so that was very uh very crude summary, but 
it's, uh, it's fairly accurate. And here's what I mean. This is what it feels like to travel on a warp rail. You are literally being thrown through space at high speeds. Uh, technically, you're, you're tethered to the rail uh, by some kind of like, uh, I don't know, techno babble, subspace energy field or <laughs> whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, but the idea is really very clear. I mean, it's, it's a railway, so to speak, um, and it's comprised of energy. So your ship is basically attaching to this railway of energy um, that runs through space. Now, I'm going to gonna try to explain all the details of it, and um, while I'm doing that, I'm just going to kind of ride around on it. Uh, so our second trip is going to be through the planetary rings, uh, and this is actually a curved rail, um, and here we go. Now, I'm, I'm guessing you've already picked up on the fact that this is a bi-directional travel system. It's, it's kind of hard to miss. Uh, when ships are flying at you head on. So yeah, what, what I mean by that is that there's both outgoing and incoming traffic on the same rail, um, which seems a little unsafe at first, and a little scary, and maybe a little thrilling all at the same time. Um, but I'm going to try to convince you that it's actually very safe and very efficient. Um, so the, the conceptual system behind the rails is quite interesting, and I enjoyed thinking of it and implementing it um, a good bit. So it's based on what you might say, um, well, you might just say it's based on wedges, really, uh, wedges of space. So if you think about these rails as kind of having a tube around them, although they don't have any visible tube because um, I really objected to the idea of obscuring space while you're traveling through it, I actually really like the fact that the rails don't hide your scenery. You can you can watch everything pass by. Um, anyway, so you can't explicitly see the space around the rails, um, but you can imagine there being this kind of tube or cylinder around them. Um, and furthermore, try to imagine that when someone requests to get on the rail, what essentially happens is... Um, you get kind of a slice of pie taken out of that uh, out of that tube, um, and so the what's called the warp node controller, or kind of the the thing that controls um, a, a set of nodes that are connected together. That that controller will intelligently split the space around the rails. Uh, such that basically everybody gets their own lane. Um, so while it looks like we're all traveling on the same rail, um, new radio menus, by the way, just want to show that real quick. Um, <laughs> sorry, I get distracted easily. So while it looks like everyone is traveling on the same rail, uh, in fact, everybody's really traveling in their own lane, in their own discreet uh, lane slice that is guaranteed to fit them and guaranteed to not overlap with someone else's lane. So, um, yeah, it, it looks scary at first, but the truth is everybody is being carefully put in their own lane so as not to collide because we don't want, you know, people burning and dying in these things. Anyway, that's the basic theory behind how they work, um, I should say that it's not completely accurate. I called them wedges. In fact, it's a little more complicated than that because, you know, it's it's not just like a piece of pie. It's also a piece of pie that you could cut at, at different inner radiuses. Um, so, uh, I don't know how to explain that any better. Anyway, it's very efficient space allocation system. Um, that basically makes sure that a lot of traffic, like a surprising amount of traffic, can actually fit on one rail while still being safe. Um, so there's your Warp Node 101 class, so to speak. And now it's time for Warp Node 202, Advanced Tactics. Um, boom, so there we go. <laughs> that was my Advanced Tactic. Uh, it was Ejection. That was warp node ejection, and despite the fact that it's largely not graphically appealing, 
um, because you can only see it from the outside perspective. That'll change, but functionally, it, it is all there. Um, and I mean, functionally, the way it works is you basically ask the rail to simply spit you out, and it does so. Uh, conversely, as I'm about to show, you can enter from any node along the rail, and that'll work too. So taken together, what this means is that the rails really provide a very interesting structure um, of space in terms of like measuring how far two places are, or, you know, how far two points of space are from each other. Um, when you take into account travel time using the rails, you get really a very, very interesting metric, very interesting structure because of the fact uh, that rails can be entered from any point and exited from any point. They're a bit more than just your kind of A to B typical pathfinding waypoints. So um, I really like that part of it. And interestingly, the AI already knows how to exploit that um, maximally. So the AI is capable of ejecting whenever it it thinks that doing so can, in fact, if you saw that guy in front of me, he just ejected. Uh, the AI will eject if it thinks that doing so will you know, get it to its destination faster. And conversely, the AI can enter from any point um, on the node, uh, sorry, along the rail. So speaking of AI, I want to show all that activity that I was talking about now in the system. So here's my little uh, system view map. Don't judge me on it because it's largely just a debug tool at the moment. But you can see on it the point, which is that uh, there's a lot of AI and the AI is using the rails just as you would expect. It's using the circular rail through the planetary belt um, and it's using the linear rails out to these two different asteroid fields. Um, and if we watched long enough, I'm sure we would see some ejection and re-entry going on uh, because it does indeed use that as I've verified. So I saw a pirate on the mini-map. I'm just going to go over here and explore because I think I'm mostly done yabbering on, or jabbering on maybe, is it? I don't know, <laughs> about warp rails. Although it does now actually occur to me, I, I forgot to mention something that is actually an important mechanic for the rails, uh, which is that the speed, your, your speed on the rail is not just a kind of constant fast, um, it actually falls off inversely as you get further away from the center of the rail. Um, so what that means is that big ships are going to naturally get allocated further out. You know, they're going to be, they're not going to be able to pack in as closely to the center of the rail. A, a, because smaller ships are using it, and B, because those wedges are not big enough for the big ships. So the natural consequence of this is that you get a rail system on which you can have loads of people, you can have loads of traffic, you can have fighters and cap ships, but the bigger traffic is naturally going to be f more fragmented, literally going to be... Um, push towards the the outer radii um, and because of that is going to be a little slower uh, naturally again because of that inverse mechanic um, so to me this is yet another uh, nice property that I enjoy uh, it's kind of cool although we didn't see it here it's kind of cool to be a fighter on the inside of the rail like you know, you're just riding the real inside um, and literally passing cap ships uh, that are surrounding you on the outer parts of the rail. It's a, I'm not gonna have time to show it, but it's a very cool experience and I enjoy it. Okay, I'm really done with rails now. It's definitely time to move on. All right, time to talk about what is arguably my favorite part of the month. Um, yeah, I think it's my favorite. It is the market UI. Uh, now, a few months ago, I showed something that had like a bunch of uh, graphs on it and a bunch of buyer and seller data. 
Um, now that was not the actual market UI. That was the details of a single item on the market. Now what you're gonna see today is kind of the high level version. Um, it's, it's the distilled summary of trading data uh, for any given location. So this is gonna show you at a glance information for all the stuff that's being bought or sold at a market. And um, yeah, I mean, it's your basic trade UI. Um, and we're gonna have a look at it. So we're gonna open it up for the station. And all right, here it is. Um, so honestly, I think it's uh, it's pretty much just what you would expect from a trade UI. Um, at least I hope you feel that way. Um, it does have some advanced features. Um, well, kind of advanced, uh, but we'll talk about them later. But anyway, uh, I mean, in the center, you're going to see a list of all the items that are either being bought or sold or both at this location. And then some basic information about each. On the left, you're going to see some category tabs. So this gives you a very fast way if you want to navigate directly, you know, to the weapons category or, um, or, or whatever. And then on the right, you got this detailed panel. Uh, whenever you click on an item, you can see some information about it on the right. And right now, there's not a lot of information filled out. That's actually really a different thing than the market. So I haven't worked much on that item information widget, as I call it. Um, but the market is just creating one. Anyway, you get the idea of how that works. Um, now, I want to uh, talk about how the the data is actually populated. Um, but first, let me point out how much ore there is here. That is actually real. That's real ore being sold by the NPCs um, who have mined in this system. So they're doing quite a good job. Uh, really, it's thanks to those warp rails. They're getting around very fast, mining very fast, um, and selling quickly, so that's nice. Now I want to show the search filter, um, which allows you to, I mean, very basically search by string uh, or substring, so I mean, it's just what you'd expect. You can basically Google, you know, the item that you want uh, if you happen to know the name of it. Um, I should also note that these weapons that we're seeing here, uh, I actually added them by script, so the ore is is real. Um, but those other items I have added by script because I wanted there to be like a substantial amount of stuff on the market for us to browse through. And right now the AI is not um, is not selling everything yet. Um, now let's have a look at comparisons. So you can actually open any number of items in the same frame on the right. This gives you a great way to compare. You know, um, my friends tell me that Hilbert's tachyon cannon is uh, is pretty much the way to go. But you know, I've also heard that um, Gamma Energy Blade is good and Doom Blaster too. Uh, frankly, they all sound very promising to me, um, which is why you should be able to compare them all at the same time, right? Which you can. I'm just holding Shift when I select them. Um, and that you know gets you a split screen on the on the right basically um, so let's buy something shall we um, it's gonna be a tough choice between Fourier's singularity accelerator and Hilbert's tachyon cannon um, the names are both frankly amazing yeah I know the procedural name generator needs some work <laughs> but I'm gonna go for the old Hilbert. <laughs> the old Hilbert cannon. Um, okay, so here's our buy panel. Um, and this, again, what you would expect, you've got a slider uh, that goes between one and the maximum uh, quantity that's available for sale here. Now, the only real interesting thing to point out here is this average price per unit section. And the reason this is interesting is because here's an example of where you see that this market is being driven by real, uh, you know, a more serious underlying data, and I'll explain that. So, if I go up to six, I I stay at two per unit, and then suddenly at seven, my average cost is changing. Why is this? Well, remember this simple trade UI is running on top of a, a actually a very real complex. Um, market system which is you know there are actual buy orders and sell orders in here um, it's not like every commodity is 
you know, always being sold at one price. So when you want to buy a bunch of some item, you're not necessarily going to get, you know, the lowest buy price, the one that showed that is being showed in this screen, um, because it's likely that there are going to be listings that are also at a higher price, you know, where the seller is trying to make more money. Um, and so the more you buy, of an item, typically the more, the higher um, of an average price you're going to be seeing. But that's not, you know, driven by some formula. It's actually driven by what the AIs have submitted uh, into the into the system. So we could uh, we could just buy some ore, um, put some put some cash in the pockets of those NPCs. Uh, this will go directly. Uh, to the factions that are doing the mining in the system and have put this ore up uh, for sale. You know, all of the procedural name generators need work. I haven't worked on them since um, since the prototype, which was over a year ago. <laughs> so if you're wondering why all the names are very funky, well, that's why. Okay, so I just bought out all of the AI, gave them uh, some money for their trouble. Now this, you'll note that um, I'm sitting outside the market, right? I'm not actually docked, so how am I buying stuff? Well, the answer is this is going into my storage locker at the station. So this is not going into my cargo because I'm not docked. But I I'm right next to the station, so of course I should be able to buy and sell from it. Um, but it's not, like I said, it's not going directly into my ship's inventory. Uh, it's going into a storage locker that I have at that station and then if I actually wanted to equip that weapon or use that ore or whatever um, you know I would need to go dock and then get it out of storage at the station um, if I were docked at these stations then I would have the option of transferring things directly to and from storage you see there's uh, sorry to and from cargo see there's a transfer to option and that will include cargo if you're docked. Um, I'm, I'm just buying some ore, <laughs> if you're wondering what I'm doing in the background. Uh, trying to give the AI some money. Um, but yeah, so this is our, our basic summary trade UI, and it's being driven by the real market data, but you know what I, what I wanna say about it, perhaps more importantly, is that for me, this is very exciting because it's the first push into kind of the real UI content. Um, we've got the final UI tech, uh, we've got LTSL, and it's uh, you know in good shape. And so, for me, this is my first real usage of all of that tech, uh, you know, to build a very serious piece of content that's that's showing what exists in the game um, to the user in a functional way. And I quite like it. Um, you're free to comment on it. I'm sure it will get uh, more polished in the future. In particular, you know, a sortable um, lists is pretty much a necessity. And a few other things I'm sure will come. But in general, you can think of this as being representative of what's to come in terms of UI content, in terms of exposing the game that exists, the limit theory that already exists in code uh, to the player, which honestly is a lot of, is kind of the greater part of the work uh, that remains, is not necessarily implementing new concepts, but uh, showing the ones that already exist to the player. And for me, this is an exciting um, kind of first demonstration of doing that in a polished and functional way. And everything that I've developed for this market is um, is going to be completely reusable with other UI components. So we're going to be seeing similar UIs very soon for cargo, fleet management, asset management, so on and so forth. Um, going to be very exciting. This, by the way, in the background, I'm showing my uh, my test bed where I actually developed the market. You know, because uh, I don't like to restart the game all the time, so I put it in its own thing to develop it and you can actually see it it runs quite a bit more fluidly here again because the game's getting a little bogged down I need to do some optimization but you can see when I interact with the market here it's really very fast very uh, very responsive 
feels good feels good man yeah all right that's that I want to let you guys have a look now at one of the new test beds that I've been using over the past two months for development. This is the warp node slash warp rail test bed. <clears throat> and um, I'm pretty sure that from the name you can guess what I've used it for. Uh, yeah, this is this is what I used to build uh, the, the warp rail functionality and aesthetics. As you can see, it is a singularly exciting test bed. Um, because there's nothing quite like being thrown through space um, at nine kilometers a second with people also going nine com kilometers a second in the other direction only a few meters away. It's exciting stuff. <laughs> and it looks pretty scary, um, but it works. Uh, so after a few trips on this rail, there are, there are 128 NPCs um, flying back and forth here between the two stations and um, after a few trips you can pretty much see it is consistently scary when traffic levels are this high but it works there are no head-on collisions lanes are safely allocated um, basically everything works as it's supposed to so that's good news um, of course you know in my experience people don't like being crashed into balls of fire. So I'm very happy that the warp rails managed to avoid that. My, my biggest gripe right now, um, probably I think the biggest piece of polish that remains is those entry animations or lack thereof. <laughs> As you can see there, the, the NPCs just kind of get sucked onto the rail uh, regardless of what direction they're facing and they're kind of being thrown down it you know, angled sideways or something. It's, uh, it's not very sleek looking. But I will definitely be attending to that. And next up, I want to give a another shout out to another test bed that has also been instrumental in the past two months work. And this is the 3D model test bed. Quite simply, uh, it just takes an object from the game and puts it in its own little world, uh, lets you view it in isolation so that you can hammer out the aesthetic of one object or one class of objects. As you can see, I'm just continually rerunning the ship generator here and examining um, the output of a certain you know, set of parameters that I'm feeding into the generator. Uh, so I've been using this on ships and stations and planets, uh, even asteroids and turrets and thrusters and pretty much everything in the game that is 3D um, I've subjected to this testbed uh, because it's such a useful way you know, for me to hammer down the aesthetic uh, in isolation. Now, I'll be the first to admit there's still plenty of room for improvement on the ship and station algorithms in particular. You know, those we always knew that those were going to be the hardest. Um, and so, you know, I'll continue to work hard on them. But the great news for me is that it gets, gets a little bit easier, you know, every month. And especially with a tool like this now that I've been using, um, it's gotten a lot easier. And uh, one of the ways you can actually concretely see that uh, see how valuable this tool is, is by the planetary rings, which, I mean, hopefully you noticed, I kind of made a point to show them this month, and I actually didn't, I didn't talk about it at all in the devlogs, if you read, so hopefully that was a, an okay surprise for you. Um, but, I mean, the cool thing is that it actually wasn't, you know, a big, really a big feature, it's not a big to-do, really. Um, it took very little time to implement these rings, and the reason is uh, because all I had to do was sit here in this test bed, you know, and reload, 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 and just, uh, you know, was pretty much flying through a new version of the shader, you know, every minute or so, and well, you know, after a few hours, that's that's a whole lot of iterations. So, really, um, can't overstate how powerful this test bed is when it comes to the content generators. Um, especially the, the graphics content generators. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you a peek at it. It's uh, another one of my little tools for the month. 
finally, in closing, I would like to show um, a rather small feature that happened this month that despite being small in terms of implementation has actually got me really darn excited for some of the possibilities it enables. So let me quickly um, go over that. And that this feature is text rendering, which was previously done via an external library, but is now being handled directly by the limit theory engine. So we're drawing text directly. A lot of good things come from this. It's much faster. It's going to enable effects. Um, here you can already see the shadow effect. It glow and outline will also be very easy to do. Just didn't get a chance to do them yet. Um, it also enables Unicode support. This just kind of fell naturally out of the whole thing. I didn't actually have to spend time, you know, supporting Japanese and Chinese and this stuff that you see here on the UI. It just it happened naturally because of the fact that um, I, I wrote the text rendering engine into the LT engine. Um, yeah, so now you can actually, if you have a Unicode font, you can actually load it and write UTF-8 strings in, in any language you want, really, uh, within LTSL. Um, so, yeah, I've done some Japanese and Chinese and Russian and Korean here, just for fun. I don't know if those are correct. Um, <laughs> who knows? Anyway, this could be great for localization. Um, and also for just having cool symbols to access in game uh, but really you know Unicode support is a very nice thing to get for free but none of these were the reason that I actually implemented text rendering none of these were what made me pull the trigger what made me pull the trigger is that having text rendering uh, that we control ourselves was really the final step in something that I've been working up to for quite some time, which is being able to render an interface, an entire UI, including all the text and the widgets and all of that stuff, being able to render that and save it to a texture, which can then be used by the game. Yes, uh, quite an ambitious goal and you might be like what does that have to do with anything uh, let me try to spell it out a little more clearly without actually spelling it out but imagine this you have a world in which it's very easy in LTSL to uh, to actually take a, a real functioning user interface and draw it on an in-game object um, a 3d in-game object that includes text uh, what could you do with that what would that world look like what would modders do in that world <laughs> well you know we'll see but I'm very hopeful that that will bring great things I will explore it a bit myself see what we can do with it um, but mostly I'm just very happy to have that functionality in existence because you guys are going to do great things with that of that I have zero doubt so happy to have our own text rendering Whew. okay well, that's quite an extensive update uh, thanks for hanging with me guys we are finally at the end um, and in closing I want to say uh, for those of you who follow me um, in the devlogs and on the forums you probably know that I had an extraordinary amount of trouble getting this update out like it is a month and a half almost overdue and it's just been an incredibly train wreck of a process uh, trying to get it finalized um and so you know there are a lot of reasons for that mostly i would say is the growing size of the game and scope of the game it's getting uh so hard to show and and wrap everything up into a little neat package at the end of the month um, as everything gets more complex and as there's more that I'm doing every month so what I'm saying what I'm trying to get at is like this has become an unwieldy process um, and my my answer to that last month was like oh okay we'll just make the date flexible well that failed ca catastrophically and I'm not afraid to admit it um, that was yeah that was absolutely um, a huge failure so 
uh, I've got some new ideas about how I'm going to fix this problem and, and improve the update process uh, to make everybody happier. And I'm not ready to announce them just yet because I still need to give it a little bit more thought. But I am going to be announcing a major change uh, to the update process um, in, I would say, the next week or two weeks. We'll see. And I'm going to be doing that through the Kickstarter updates. So for those of you who follow exclusively on YouTube, um, I would recommend checking out the Kickstarter page that is linked in the description. Uh, maybe, you know, again, in a week or two weeks or so, just so you can stay afloat of, of what's happening with the update process. And I'm also, I'll also just let you guys know that I'm hoping to get a newsletter together soon, uh, as soon as I can, which will allow people who don't follow through Kickstarter to be able to get all the text updates, uh, which they're currently, you know, would have to go to the website to look at. So... Um, I believe uh, that finally is everything, and I'm not going to lie to you guys, I'm very excited to go to sleep, so I'm going to get out of here, and I really <clears throat> appreciate you watching, appreciate you guys' support, and more than ever, appreciate the uh, good vibes and, and happy feels, because <laughs> I'm a little stressed these days, but it'll get better. Uh, I still love this game to death, and it's really the dream job, so um, anyway... I'll see you guys soon, and until then, have a great time and take it easy. Bye.